This is George Muller. George Muller's life was an inspiration to people worldwide. His life is seen as a demonstration of what can be accomplished through prayer and trusting in God. Muller's life has inspired so many, such as the revivalist Evan Roberts, the great preachers of the day, such as Charles Spurgeon, the evangelists, such as D.L. Moody, and that great missionary, Hudson Taylor. Muller on one occasion preached in Charles Spurgeon's assembly, and it's said that Spurgeon was greatly impressed by Muller's humility. Spurgeon said that Muller was like a modern day Enoch. He'd never met such a man that walked with God. Well, Muller certainly didn't like to be known as a great man of faith. He preferred to be addressed as the servant of God. In his youth, he was certainly far from being a saint. As a young boy growing up in Germany in the early 1800s, he was quite the rebel. London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews sent George Muller from the smog of London to the fresh air of a small fishing village in Devon to rest. In a sense, it was like a fresh start for Muller. Well, I'm in Devon with Peter Ellis to discover the remarkable changes that took place here in George Muller's early life. This is a beautiful place to be. I'm not quite sure if we pronounce it Tainmouth or Tynemouth. What's the right way, Peter? Well, it depends if you're a local or not. If you're a local, they usually call it Tainmouth, but if you're officially, it's Tainmouth. OK. And this is the place that Muller came to rest. It's also the place where he had two most profound spiritual experiences. Tell us a bit about them. The first experience he had was, um, he called it here his second conversion. He knew about the Bible, but he hadn't actually read the Bible for himself. And it was here in Tynmouth that he really did begin to study the Bible. There was one dear lady who talked to him uh, about being rebaptized, and yet he'd been baptized as a child, hadn't he? That's right. He, um, as a child, he had been baptized in the church, and then he had been confirmed at about the age of 14. A lady did challenge him about baptism. She said, look, have you been baptized? And he said, well, yes, I have. When I was a child, I was baptized. And she said, that is not what the scriptures say. Go and read the scriptures and see what it says for yourself. And he went and he, and he read the relevant scriptures and uh, he realized that he did need to be baptized by full immersion, as the scripture states. And that became a foundational for all of his life from this point on. That's right, time and time again, in every aspect of his life, he would go back and he'd say, well, what does the Bible say? For the first four years after my conversion, I made no progress because I neglected the Bible. God began to show me that the Word of God alone is our standard of judgment in spiritual things, that it can be explained only by the Holy Spirit, and that in our day, as well as in former times, He is the teacher of His people. The Lord enabled me to put it to the test of experience by laying aside commentaries and almost every other book, simply reading the Word of God and studying it. The first evening that
that I shut myself into my room to give myself to prayer and meditation over the scriptures, I learned more in a few hours than I had done during a period of several months previously. But the particular difference was that I received real strength for my soul in doing so. When I regularly read with reference to my heart and soul, I directly made progress. My life and walk became very different. And though ever since that I have very much fallen short of what I might and ought to be, yet by the grace of God, I have been enabled to live much nearer to him than before. Muller went walking in a park just like this every morning during the time that he was in Tainmouth. He wasn't in the best of health and he felt physical exercise and spiritual exercise were important for him. That's right. He came to a lovely part of the country like this and uh, for recuperation, um, and I'm sure he felt a lot better for it. Of course, he used to come with his Bible and he used to come on his own, and he would spend a great deal of time in prayer and reading his Bible out in the open air to get his mind and his thoughts settled. And... But one of the interesting things he says is that he used to get out of bed in the morning and he'd try and get focused for prayer and it just wouldn't work no. for him. No, right. And so it was this getting out of the house, going walking mm. and praying and reading the Bible at the same time yeah. that for him was the means of really spending time with God. That's right. He really used to enjoy that time, I think, just alone with the Lord in a garden somewhere or just walking along the beach maybe. But just being with the Lord was, was so important to him. One of the fascinating things about Muller is here is a man who preached three times every Sunday and yet he never studied theological uh, commentaries and, 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 and doctrines in, in order to preach. He purely spent time with the Lord, asking the Lord to speak to his own heart. Yes, that's right. He didn't use commentaries. He just let the spirit of the Lord just guide him in what he should do. And I think on scenarios such as going for a walk, that's where he really got close to the Lord. And I think the Lord must have spoken to him. How different when the soul is refreshed and made happy early in the morning from what it is when, without spiritual preparation, the service, the trials, and the temptations of the day come upon one. Now I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditate on it for the profit of my own inner man. It is not enough to have prayerful reading only, we must also meditate on the word, pondering over what has been read. This is deeply important. I find it very beneficial to my health to walk thus for meditation before breakfast, and I'm now so in the habit of using the time for that purpose. Since God has taught me this point, it is as plain to me as anything that the first thing the child of God has to do, morning by morning, is to obtain food for the inner man. As the outward man is not fit for work for any length of time except we take food, and as this is one of the first things we do in the morning, so it should be with the inner man. What is the food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the Word of God. And here again, not the simple reading of the Word of God, so that it only passes through our minds, just as water runs through a pipe, but considering what we read, pondering over it, and applying it to our hearts. It was in Tainmouth where Muller met his wife, Mary Groves. And of course, through meeting his wife, Mary Groves, uh, he also met Mary Groves' brother, and it was a brother who had the profound effect upon them as a couple, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, Anthony, her brother, was uh, a dentist, a practicing dentist in Exeter, um, and he gave it all up um, to, uh, to go out as a missionary, a missionary in faith. So he was totally reliant on God for all his needs. And uh, that, that really did affect Muller and uh, his new wife, Mary. They actually had a verse, and it says, sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, 
where no thief approaches, nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm sure they must have spent hours discussing, talking, mm. but at the end of the day, they decided that was for them. Sell everything they had yeah. and just be totally reliant upon Absolutely. God. Absolutely, totally out in faith. Wow. But I mean, they, they met within three months, they were married. Uh, even though they were sold out for God, life was tough for them, wasn't it? And it, as a couple, they didn't have life easy. They didn't, no, no. Of course, not just for the financial um, burdens that they, they are to have. Their faith was tested on many times. Because personally as a family, and particularly with children, they mm. su suffered, didn't they? They did, they did. In total, they had four children. Um, they had a daughter, and they had Lydia, and they also had a son, Elijah, and two children that were born, stillborn. Um, they lost Elijah at the age of one. So faith really was put to the test in those early days of their marriage. And, uh, and yet God supplied all their need. God supplied all the comfort that they needed during that time. And um, it's a wonderful story to think that as a young married couple, that they went through so much and yet their faith didn't fail. I was willing to carry out into my life whatever I should find in the scriptures. I could say, I will do his will. I give myself fully to the Lord. Honor, pleasure, money, my physical powers, my mental powers, all laid down at the feet of Jesus. And I became a great lover of the word of God. God does expect us to be obedient children and will have us practice what he has taught us. The Lord Jesus Christ says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. As in John 13, verse 17. In the measure in which we carry out what our Lord Jesus taught, so much in measure are we happy children. If there is one single point I would wish to have spread all over this country and over the whole world, it is just this that we should seek beloved Christian friends, not to be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word, as in James 1, 22. The Ebenezer Chapel is now known as the Gospel Hall, and this is the place where Muller had his very first pastorate. He was aged mm, only about 24, 25 at the time, just a young lad really, wasn't he, at that time? He came here for the reopening of the church. There were many there that said, oh, please be our pastor. And he was waiting, of course, on the will of God to know what he wanted in his life. So eventually he became the pastor here. He felt the need to move away from the legalistic way that pastors ran churches. One of the big issues of the day concerns something that we don't understand today, but it was the idea of renting pews. Uh, it, it seems so foreign to us now, but tell us about it. Renting pews was the idea that uh, families would come in and depending on their social status, how much money they had, depended upon which pew they could sit on. Obviously, the more wealthy they were, the nearer the front they sat. He didn't like this idea. He realized that from scripture, this was wrong. And he abolished that whole um, idea of pew rents. Now, the problem was then, of course, is that the church didn't know how then to pay him. So he said, don't bother about my payment. We put a box at the back of the, of the church and any donations that would be put into the box, that will be what my wages effectively would be. So it was the very early stages of him going out in faith. It was the very early signs of him being totally dependent on his Lord. And he just wanted to, wanted to live by faith. If anyone desires to live a life of faith and trust in God, he must follow these principles. Firstly, do not merely say that you trust in God, but you must really do so. Often individuals profess to trust in God, but they embrace every opportunity where they may directly or indirectly tell someone about their need. I do not say it is wrong to make known our financial situation, but it hardly displays trust in God to expose our needs for the sake of getting other people to help us. If we do trust in him, 
we must be satisfied to stand with him alone. Secondly, you must be content whether you be rich or poor. You must be willing to live in abundance or in poverty. Thirdly, you must be willing to take the money in God's way, not merely in large sums, but in small. Many times I've had a single shilling given to me. To have refused such tokens of Christian love would have been ungracious. Finally, you must be willing to live as the Lord's steward. If anyone does not give out of the blessing that the Lord gives to him, then the Lord, who influences the hearts of his children to give, would soon cease those channels to be dried up. My good income increased even more when I determined that by God's help, his poor and his work would be helped by my money. From that time on, the Lord was pleased to entrust me with more. Peter, the other big change that came over George Muller during his time in Timmouth was his understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. Can you just share with us a little bit? Yes, he was. Um, he, he grew to know and to appreciate the work of the Holy Spirit in so much as that um, historically the church here had always had a, a pastor um, for all their meetings. Um, but um, he, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, decided that the morning meetings or the communion service um, should be spirit-led. And since then, really, the church here has, has, has done that practice of spirit-led uh, morning worship and um, in the remembrance service and the worship service. Um, and that still goes on today. So if I understand you right, what you're saying is you don't have a person at the front of the church with an order of service and, and leads the congregation through it, but you really open the meeting up and say, Holy Spirit, come, you lead and you direct what happens. That's right, there is no formality. Um, it really is spirit-led from, from the choosing of the hymns to the worshiping, to the giving thanks, to the breaking of bread. It's all spirit-led. Prayer the Word of God and His Spirit should be united together. We should go to the Lord repeatedly in prayer and ask Him to teach us by His Spirit through His Word. If I look to the Spirit alone without the Word, I lay myself open to great delusions also. If the Holy Spirit guides us, He will do it according to the Scriptures and never contrary to them. After two years in Tenmouth, Muller moved with his friend Henry Craig to pastor in Bristol. Now, what happened in Bristol not only transformed the lives of a society, but also transformed a city, a country, and lives worldwide. I'm in Bristol now with Julian Marsh to discover the remarkable events that took place through prayer and faith in God. So Julian, some 80 years ago, the bombs were raining down upon Bristol and the building that was on this site was destroyed. Yes, and it was. And that's what we're here to talk about. Tell us about it. Well, it seems somewhat ironic that George Muller, who was born in Germany, <laughs> that the building was actually demolished uh, during the Second World War. But uh, he was the pastor here of this particular building that was on this site for getting on for 70 years. There must be thousands of churches in the Bristol and, and the surrounding areas that we're in. And we're here talking about a church that was demolished some 80 years ago. What was so significant about what Muller did and the church that he was establishing on this site? George Muller was in the vanguard of some of the early brethren type churches and this movement had been sweeping the country in Plymouth and in Dublin and, and other places in the country uh, to try and return to some sort of basic New Testament type Christianity for church organization. It was a, a group of like-minded churches that were seeking to revive things that were lost, the regularity of the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the abolition of pew rents which was what uh, the, the amount that people paid to sit in the, 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 the seat that they had. It was about body ministry. It wasn't about a denominational structure. There was no paid minister. There was no single person in authority in, in the church. It was about a, a team ministry of various leaders who sought to actually lead the church. And uh, it, it had a particular 
uh, a characteristic, and that characteristic was to seek to seek to reach out to uh, unbelievers and and to see people saved. People started to be attracted to to the church. People got saved. In fact, during the lifetime of the church here, uh, six churches were planted uh, around the city uh, as a result of the ministry that took place here. I long to have something to point my brethren to as a visible proof that our God and Father is the same faithful God as ever he was, as willing as ever to prove himself to be the living God in our day as formerly to all who put their trust in him. Julian, we've talked a lot about Muller's church and uh, his work uh, pastoring that, but he had a much bigger vision than that. 28, was he, 29, when the whole vision of the uh, Institute began to be formed in his mind, uh, where he had a worldview. Tell us about it. He set up what's become known as the, the Scriptural Knowledge Institution, or SKI, Sky, in 1834. And it had originally four objects. One was to establish day schools, Sunday schools, and Christian schools around the area. Secondly, to assist pupils from poorer families to actually access those schools. Thirdly, to distribute tracts and copies of the Bible and, and other uh, Christian literature. And fourthly, to support missionaries all around the world. And people started just to give him sums of money in order to fund those uh, various activities. But there was a fifth object that was added uh, the following year in 1835, and that was to establish an orphan house. And that uh, institution still exists today. I think there's about a million and a quarter pounds each year is given to support overseas missionary activities. The people that he got involved with were people like Hudson Taylor, yes. who was the founder of the China Inland Mission, now called the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And there's still the letters, aren't there, which corresponded between Taylor and, and Muller, and Muller really wanted to encourage Hudson Taylor in the work that he was doing in China and just development of mission. That's right, the stimulus to live by faith that uh, James Hudson Taylor actually had came directly from uh, the mentoring of uh, George Muller in many ways. My dear Hudson Taylor, my chief object is to tell you that I love you in the Lord, that I feel deeply interested about the Lord's work in China, and that I pray daily for you. I thought it might be a little encouragement to hear of one more who felt for you and who remembered you before the Lord. But were it otherwise, had you even no one to care for you, or did you at least seem to be in a position as if no one cared for you, you will always have the Lord to be with you. Remember Paul's case at Rome, as in 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. My dear Hudson, on him then reckon, to him look, on him depend, and be assured, if you walk with him and look to him and expect help from him, he will never fail you. An older brother who has known the Lord for 44 years, who writes this, says to you for your encouragement that he has never failed him. In the greatest difficulties, in the heaviest trials, in the deepest poverty and necessities, he has never failed me. But because I was enabled by his grace to trust in him, he has always appeared for my help. I delight in speaking well of his name. With great affection, George Muller.
So this is Wilson Street, Gordon. That the houses on this side of the road are original, but the houses on the other side are not. And it was actually on the other side of the road that those first orphan houses were uh, uh, were occupied. So the very first house that he he took was number one Wilson Street. Number is that one right? Wilson Street. Uh, no, number six. Number six. Followed by number one. one followed by number three and number four. Wow. Just an amazing thing, really, just to do that. He, he lived in number six, and he opened the door of number six to allow uh, uh, the young people to have some food, and, and he would also read the Bible to them and, and teach them about Christian activities. But it became very clear to him, because of the social conditions of the time in Bristol, that they needed somewhere to actually live, they needed somebody to uh, care for them 24-7. Uh, I mean, following the Napoleonic Wars, uh, that they introduced something called the Corn Laws, which were like tariffs on food. And so food was very expensive, people were hungry, uh, there were food riots in Bristol. And together with the fact that disease was rife, was prevalent in Bristol, in every major city at that time. But in Bristol, at the time when George Muller came here, there was a very serious cholera epidemic. Many, many people died, not just parents, but children as well. And as a result of the poor conditions, as a result of the uh, food problems, there were many children who were on the streets, and George Muller decided that he'd convert his home into an orphanage. Thousands of children literally lived on the streets. That's what we're saying. I saw yes. one figure which said as many as 250,000 children That's right. were dependent just on begging and stealing. Just amazing. And, of course, the alternative was the workhouse or was prison. I mean, those were the only secure places that were very unpleasant places for children uh, or adults to actually go when they were suffering such poverty. George Muller saw the social conditions, wanted to do something about it, but he also wanted to demonstrate that God still answers prayer. And so what he wanted very clearly to do was to establish a work where he was totally dependent upon God for all the supplies, everything. So he would pray daily for long periods of time in order that God would actually provide all that was needed. He would not tell anyone if he had any financial needs, he would just tell God and no one else. So the work here was both a, a social care type work, but it was also a demonstration of God still answering prayer today. By taking those children in and, and relying on God and, and just sensing what God was saying all the time, there were all sorts of amazing answers to prayer. I mean, during his lifetime, George Muller claimed to have had 50,000 prayers answered, of which 30,000 were answered within 24 hours. Just an amazing thing. This was the site of all sorts of uh, uh, um, answers to, to prayer. There was one instance where uh, George Muller was praying for a sum of money, I think it was three pounds, to feed the children for the following day. And uh, as a result of uh, uh, that, he was waiting on the post. In those days, there were about nine posts a day, not just one. Nice. And uh, the last post produced the three pounds that he was waiting for. And of course, it was also here that the famous story of the milk float breaking down and the baker and You'll so on. you have to tell us that. Go oh, on. it's a wonderful story, really. The children had nothing for breakfast on one particular day. And George Muller prayed a prayer, simple grace. Lord, we thank you for your gracious provision for us today. Uh, and the children looked around, and of course, there was nothing on the table. But at that moment, the door knocked, and it was the local baker who said that God had woken him up at two o'clock the previous morning and told him that there was a need at the orphan house here in Wilson Street and that he should bake bread. So he put it in a wheelbarrow, wheeled it down Ashley Hill, just around the corner here, into this road and knocked at the very moment that George Muller said grace. And then just at that moment, the milk float that was delivering milk to the houses broke down outside his house and the milkman had to do something with the milk and just gave it to the orphan house. Amazing stories, and that just proves God. That's right. Yeah. And so he literally, into number six, was it you said, he took in a number of girls? So it's 30 girls. 30 girls. And the first girl was Charlotte Hill, and she was the first of 10,000 that he cared for during his lifetime. And then came number one? And, and then that came the number boys? one, and then that was for boys, and then number three was for girls, and number four was for boys. But of course, by then, the, the neighbours were beginning to get upset. Oh, yes. They you... didn't like it because there were so many ruffian, scruffian yes. children all around the place. Well, I think we would all complain if there were 130, 140 children in our road playing football or whatever they were, they, yeah. they were doing. So he then started to look for land uh, in the Bristol area that he 
could actually build purpose-built orphanages. The idea of this young 30-year-old yeah. pastor yes. building an orphanage, I mean, I mean, the money must have been out of his world that he needed in, in, in the times that he lived in. That's right. And, and so this really was going to prove God. It was going to prove God. And I think the interesting thing too is that he grew stronger in his faith as he saw God answering prayer. But as he saw God answering prayer, so it, it emboldened him to ask for more and more and more. By the grace of God, my heart says, Lord, if I could be sure that it is thy will that I should go forward in this matter, I would do so cheerfully. And on the other hand, if I could be sure that these are vain, foolish, proud thoughts, that they are not from thee, I would, by thy grace, hate them and entirely put them aside. While the prospect before me would have been overwhelmingly had I looked at it naturally, I was never even for once permitted to question how it would end. For as from the beginning, I was sure it was the will of God that I should go to the work of building for him this large orphan home. So also from the beginning, I was as certain that the whole would be finished as if the home had been already filled. We left the story in Wilson Street where uh, Muller was uh, beginning to question whether God was saying something else because he was facing the difficulties of not enough space, about the neighbours complaining, about the children playing in the street. And he was beginning to feel that nudge from the Lord that it was time to move on and to move out. But what to? And that's where we need to start our story. Um, Julian, great things began to happen. And uh, you tell us the story. Well, you're quite right, Gordon, in saying that it was an important decision for him to make, and it wasn't a natural decision for him to make. Uh, he, he wasn't particularly in favour of uh, purpose-built buildings. Was that a wise use of money and so on? So he prayed and prayed that God would, would clearly direct him. And even after he had all the money, he still spent six weeks earnestly praying that God would show him. And eventually God did show him very clearly that this was the right thing to do. And there's a remarkable story of when he uh, that, that's recounted by a man called Benjamin Parry. And uh, uh, this story is the fact that Muller was looking for land. He wanted seven acres of land. The prevailing price in those days for an acre of land was 200 pounds an acre. And he looked, he found this plot of land that we're standing on now. And uh, uh, he went to the home of the person who owned the land. He was out, he went to his workplace, he was out. The following day, he went to visit him again. And as soon as he met the owner of the land, the, the landowner actually said, well, I've been praying about this and God has spoken to me through the night and I should sell this land to you for 120 pounds an acre instead of 200 pounds an acre. Within 10 minutes, the deal was done, all was signed and immediately then work took place with free architects, free builders, uh, provision and all the money in place and number one house that housed 300 children was built and uh, within a year that was full and so number two house was built that housed 400 children number three that is in our backdrop here housed 450 children four and five over there uh, housed 450 children each so by 1870 there was actually room for 2,050 orphans at any one time, all maintained, all clothed, all fed, all educated, all cared for through the prayers of one man. He was heavily criticised in some quarters for uh, uh, preventing factories and mines and, and other places of heavy employment from having children because he was accused of educating children beyond their status. But actually what he wanted to do was to provide every single one of them with a hope for the future that involved a job and also Christian faith. My chief object was the glory of God by giving a practical demonstration as to what could be accomplished simply through prayer and faith in order thus to benefit the church at large and to lead a careless world to see the reality of the things of God by showing them in this work. Oh, it is good to trust in the living God, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Be assured, if you walk with God and look to him and expect help from him, 
he will never fail you. Expect great things from God and great things you will have. There is no limit to what he is able to do. Praises forever to his glorious name. It was a huge step of faith for Muller to step out and to really believe God for the finances for these homes. But the scriptures were what supported him. Psalm 34, 8 was one such verse. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. And again in verse 10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing and Muller just stood on that word and it came true. One of the things that I like, Julian, uh, about reading Muller's story is he didn't simply expect other people to give, but he, he used every resource as possible. So once the homes were open, the children tilled the land, things were knitted and sold, um, people who gave the goods, he tried to get the best price. He, he, he sought to raise money by every means possible. He wanted the children to be busy, he wanted the children to be engaged and involved, to learn things about life and of course he also wanted them to learn things about God and how God provided as well. So he was always very open in sharing with the children how God had provided in all sorts of ways. In films, orphanages are often depicted as places where the doors are shut and strange things go on behind. But one of Muller's strengths was that he encouraged visitors to come. And uh, some of those visitors are well-known people. Yes, one example of that is uh, Charles Dickens. He actually visited one day and George Muller allegedly said, well, I haven't really got time to show you around, but I'll, I'll have a boy and a girl orphan to actually show you around. And as a result of showing Charles Dickens around the homes, Charles Dickens then was one of the leading advocates for the work of Muller in helping to support and encourage and uh, provide for uh, needy children. I was very touched when I, I read about the kind of sending out ceremony that took place for every boy and every girl as they left. He put a Bible into one hand and a coin into the other hand. Mm. And he said to them, make sure that the, the Bible in that hand never leaves your side. That's right. Uh, the, the coin will go, but the Bible mustn't. Absolutely, yes. And, and this was a very, very strong element in everything that actually happened here. There were daily reading of the Bible, daily teaching about the, the Bible and how it might apply. There's two verses in Proverbs chapter 3 which I think are very, very important and summarise what we've been talking about. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Many have asked me how I sought to know the will of God. In trivial matters and in transactions involving most important issues, I have found the following method always effective. First, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regards to a given matter. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever it may be. Having done this, I do not leave the result to feeling or simple impressions. If so, I make myself liable to great delusions. Then I seek the will of the Spirit of God through or in connection with the Word of God. The Spirit and the Word must be combined. If I look to the Spirit alone without the Word, I lay myself open to great delusions also. Next, I take into account providential circumstances. These plainly indicate God's will in connection with His Word and Spirit. Then I ask God in prayer to reveal His will to me. Thus, through prayer to God, the study of the Word and reflection, I come to a deliberate judgment according to the best of my ability and knowledge. And if my mind is thus at peace and continued so after two or three petitions, I proceed accordingly. The Muller organization looks after and cares for more orphans today than they ever did in George Muller's time. It's an amazing fact, Julian, and uh, the work is just 
blossoming all over the world. Uh, yes, it is. And the Scriptural Knowledge Institution, of course, was central to what George Muller was, was actually seeking to do. And the support that he uh, was able to give to missionaries all over the world continues today. And uh, I think each year about one and a quarter million pounds is sent out to support missionaries. And many of them are working amongst poor people in Africa and other parts of the world. And you're quite right in saying that, that there are more orphans today who are being cared for through the faith and the finances of Muller's than perhaps in George Muller's day, which is an amazing thing. George Muller also was a man who believed that God had a plan and a purpose for church. And in the same way that the, all this work that we've talked about flowed out of the vision for the Bethesda Church in, uh, uh, in Bristol, uh, so too he wants to support and encourage churches in order to reach out today to their communities. So there are many people who are involved in schools work, in children's work, in adult work, in parenting and all sorts that we're actually giving some practical support and help these days. But prayer and seeking God, seeing God provide, and being able to say God still provides today is crucial, it's key to all that is done. There are four principles for Christians to follow by which they might be strengthened in their faith. The first principle is to read the Bible and meditate upon it. God becomes known to us through prayer and meditation upon his word. Secondly, seek to maintain an upright heart and a good conscience. The third principle is this. If you desire your faith to be strengthened, you should not shrink from opportunities where your faith may be tried. Trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. Remember, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. The last important principle for strengthening your faith is to let God work for you. When the hour of trial comes, do not work a deliverance of your own. The greater the difficulty to be overcome, the more it will be seen to the glory of God how much can be done by prayer and faith. Through the Lord's Orphanage, Muller had achieved his goal to give a visible proof that God is real. At the age of 70, Muller showed no signs of slowing down. He wanted to do more to glorify God. I'm visiting the Muller Museum in Bristol to meet Sarah McFadden to learn more of the miraculous events that occurred in Muller's later life. Well, welcome. This is the George Muller Museum in Bristol. Fantastic, isn't it? And look at this timeline that's up here. And, and I think the amazing thing I find about Muller is he's, he's done all these things and then you get to 70 when most people are thinking about retiring and he suddenly begins a new ministry. Uh, yeah, so George Muller travelled 200,000 miles over a period of 17 years. He did all of this before aviation, so he travelled by boat and even by rickshaw when he was in India. He went as far afield as Australia and New Zealand and also when he was in the US, he was actually invited to meet the sitting president at the time, President Hayes, at the White House. Quite amazing, isn't it? I mean, really, transport was very, very basic, wasn't it? It would be by horse and cart the majority of time. Yeah, absolutely. George Muller would be away from Bristol for up to two years at a time on his preaching tour. One particular story, isn't there, where he was desperate to get to somewhere he was due to preach, and fog descended and the captain said, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the captain tells the story Story, that he was heading to Quebec um, and he'd been on the bridge of the ship for 22 hours straight um, and he was quite startled when he got a tap on his shoulder and it was George Muller and George Muller let the captain know that he needed to be in Quebec uh, in a few days time for a speaking engagement and the captain said 
it's impossible. Yeah. There's, there's no way. George Muller said, maybe we should pray about it. So George Muller and the captain went down to the chart room and the captain actually was a bit begrudging uh, in doing it and wondered what lunatic asylum this person <laughs> was from. Um, but George Muller prayed um, and asked God to lift the fog so that he could get uh, to Quebec in time. Um, but isn't there an interesting PS on that story? The captain then thought, I'd better pray. Yeah. And, and, and Muller said, no, and he stopped him. Why? He did. Uh, George Muller said that, no, he didn't need to pray because he felt that God had already answered his prayer and invited the captain to go outside and look. And indeed, when they went outside, the fog had indeed been lifted. And he got to his meeting in time and... He did, absolutely. To... And the captain was actually an unbeliever before this happened. And, and he attributes his coming to faith to this encounter with George Muller. I mean, that's what Muller's life was all all about, wasn't it? Um, seeing the miraculous in order that people then would be attracted to the faith and become believers. Absolutely, yeah. Just a part of his everyday life. In seeking to understand the conditions of successful prayer, we must compare Scripture with Scripture. Let us begin with 1 John 5, 14, 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Here is the first condition to be attended to. We have to ask God for the things which are according to his will. And should we be little acquainted with the will of God about any matter, we must first ask him to teach and instruct us. Secondly, the Lord Jesus said we should ask in his name if we wish our petitions granted, as in John 14, 13, 14. Another point is that if we exercise faith in the power of God and in his willingness to hear us, as in Mark 11:24. We must be looking out for the answer. There are few children of God who doubt his ability to give, but many doubt his willingness. There is another point, as in Psalm 66, 18, which is an important one. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. There remains one thing more, that we continue to wait on God till the answer comes. Then let us set afresh with renewed earnestness and faith to all our petitions, if they have been according to the will of God and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with faith in the willingness of God to give what we have asked, the answers must come. I have myself had to wait for a long time to get certain blessings. In many instances, the answer has come instantaneously or in the same hour or the same day. Yet in other things, I have had to wait years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years and upwards. Yet invariably at the last, the answer has come. I say it to encourage you, my brethren and sisters in Christ, Begin afresh to bring your petitions before God. He will hear you. It's said that during George Muller's lifetime, he received donations and gifts to a value of about one point five million pounds. Anyone worked out how much that is in today's money? Yeah, that's just over a hundred million pounds in today's money. And you've given me a copy of a receipt uh, C.T. Studd and a donation of £5,000. Yeah, absolutely. So he was uh, the founder of WEC um, and actually uh, it was some funds uh, that he uh, gave away um, and we've managed to kind of marry up uh, this receipt um, and the story of the funds uh, that he'd given away. And, and you've got a copy in your records and I've just been given it of a letter George Muller on the 
12th of April 1887, wrote to Sturt, he says, my dear Mr. Sturt, he says, after a long missionary tour that I've had in New South Wales and Queensland and China and Japan, he discovered the letter from C.T. Sturt, he's replying to him, and uh, he's talking just about the great interest that he's got in missionary work in China and Japan. And uh, he says, I've heard of the Lord's grace bestowed upon you and how God has wrought through you. I pray that you may have spiritual increase and abound yet more and more to the end of your course. It's great. Records are all here, aren't they? Yeah. Everything that Muller did was based upon this book. This is one of his actual Bibles. He read the Bible all the way through about 200 times, yeah. and, and even a hundred of them were on his knees just seeking the Lord. You're, you're going to read for us just a couple of verses that had significance for him. What have you got? Yeah, so uh, Philippians 4 uh, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That must have been a profound one for him. If you've got a thousand orphans on all these houses, he must have had so many things coming at him all the time. Learning not to be anxious, but to trust in God was key for him. Yeah, he uplifted everything he needed in prayer to God. Um, the next verse I've got is James 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. There's a real danger, isn't there, when we look at someone like George Muller, to think that he was the, the great man of God, um, and life was absolutely wonderful for him, and all these amazing things happened. The reality was, his life had got great pain and trials and troubles in it. It did, yeah. Life certainly uh, wasn't always easy and straightforward for George Muller. His wife um, and his son passing away as well. Uh, his son Elijah uh, was very young when he died. I mean, he married twice and both wives died before him. They did, yeah. And his eldest daughter, Lydia, as well, actually passed away before him as well. So he certainly faced quite a bit of loss in his life. But all that went on was based on this book and what he would say is childlike faith, take it at its word, believe it and act on it. Psalm 119 verse 68, Thou Lord art good and doest good. During the six days that my beloved wife was on her deathbed, my soul was sustained by these words. On account of what I had found out about the action of my dear wife's heart when I felt her pulse. But though my heart was nigh to be broken on account of the depth of my affection, I said to myself, the Lord is good and doeth good. All will be according to his own blessed character. Nothing but that which is good like himself can proceed from him. I prayed, if it may be, rise up yet again, my precious wife. Thou art able to do it, though she is so ill. But howsoever thou dealest with me, only help me to continue to be perfectly satisfied with thy holy will. What I have to do as his child is to be satisfied with what my Father does, that I may glorify him. The Lord was good and did good in giving her to me. She was a truly devoted Christian. He was good and did good in so long leaving her to me, who was God's own gift to me as a companion in joy and sorrow and service for 39 years and four months. The Lord is good and doing good in taking my beloved wife because she had worked long, very long, and very much on earth. And he was now pleased to appoint her to other service. He was most of all good and doing good in giving to my dearest wife 
what had been long the desire of her heart, ever to be with Jesus. I now rejoice as I realize how far happier she is in beholding her Lord whom she loved so well than in any joy she has known or could know here. Her happiness gives joy to me. God himself has done it. I am satisfied with him. So in the 1800s, um, majority of people didn't live to 92, did they? Which is what George Muller did. Was there an average age? Uh, it was about uh, 40 that people lived to in Bristol at that time. Okay, so here he is at 92, uh, he dies, uh, the, the Bristol Times says the whole city came to a standstill. It did, absolutely. We've got some pictures of it up on the wall here. You can see the streets are lined with people. Um, it was one of the few days actually that shops and factories in Bristol just came to a stop and the city itself came to a standstill. I, I love the, the headline, the the Bristol Times, which presumably was a secular newspaper, yeah. it actually said at the time, he Muller was raised up for the purpose of showing that the age of miracles had not passed. Absolutely. The idea that he you know, would have thousands of people lining the streets on his deathbed, would he just wouldn't understand it because his whole life, I mean, the idea of being in a museum like this, it just would be strange to him, wouldn't it? Yeah, George Muller wanted all of the glory uh, to go to God uh, for all that he um, had accomplished. Um, he would say that it was through uh, the grace of God um, that it all happened. Christians in Muller's day really believed that he was some kind of superhero, some kind of great miracle worker, at a level that they would never be able to reach. Muller was at pains to say, that's not the case. What I have achieved, any Christian can, who really puts their trust in God. He says there are three principles, trusting in God, living by faith, and absolute belief in the Word of God. On one occasion, Muller was asked, well, are you a special kind of miracle worker? And this is the reply that he gave. Let not Satan deceive you in making you think you could not have the same faith, but that it is only for persons situated as I am. I live in the spirit of prayer. I pray as I walk, when I lie down, and when I rise. When I lose such a thing as a key, I ask the Lord to direct me to it, and I look for an answer to my prayer. When a person with whom I have an appointment does not come, I ask the Lord to be pleased to hasten him to me, and I look for an answer. Thus, in all my temporal and spiritual concerns, I pray to the Lord and expect an answer to my requests. And may you do the same?